Great to have everybody here today. I'm sorry my voice is a little um, creaky. I uh, struck through. Great, great timing. <laughs> so welcome to our first uh, annual Corporate Community Service Symposium. My name is Jennifer Clinton, the president of Global Times U.S., formerly known, well, formerly NCIB. We have a great session in store for you today um, to bring forward a really important conversation around um, the connection and partnerships that um, many of you, many of our member organizations have with the corporate sector and many ideas um, for you to think about in terms of partnering with uh, corporations. We estimate that um, corporations provide pro bono services in the thousands of hours to our member organizations as well as almost two million dollars in financial support. So you're, it's not news to you that corporations play a very, very big role in the work that we do. Um, so to get us to start this afternoon, we're pleased to hear from a good friend and colleague of the Global Ties U.S. Network, Trevor Gunn, who brings an incredible perspective to this conversation. I've asked Trevor to share a few words um, in his context of why this conversation is so important. Trevor currently serves as the Managing Director of International Relations for the Minneapolis-based Medtronic, the world's largest independent medical technology company. Trevor was formerly longtime director of the Commerce Department's Business Information Service for the newly independent states, the clearinghouse for the U.S. government information for doing business in the former Soviet Union. He served for the past 17 years as adjunct professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and he sits on the U.S. State Department's Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy. So Trevor, welcome. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, we've stayed, we've been in sort of a category, I think, of their sponsorship that uh, no one else has been in. We try, try to encourage more competition in that sector, so we think very, very highly of the Minnesota International Center, which is sort of a beacon of globalism uh, in, in, a, uh, in Minnesota, which in fact is a very globally minded state, uh, and very globally open minded state. Uh, but I think uh, uh, there's nobody in the United States that, that couldn't get more uh, and, and couldn't do more. And I want to obviously want to introduce her in a second, but I obviously reflect directly on, on Deirdre's work at Pixera. Uh, we're actually engaged with them uh, as a company right now, particularly our philanthropic arm, but with some coordination over the commercial side, which is where I, where I reside, uh, in terms of global, global corporate volunteerism. Uh, very, very important for companies. Uh, uh, people call it by different names, uh, global fluency. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, interesting ways to explain it. Deirdre, and I go back some time, we got to know each other in difficult parts of the world. They say that if you can, uh, if you can hack the former so you can almost hack anything. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, Deirdre's going to talk a little bit more about that. We're specifically uh, working actually in, in launching these programs in Ghana, India, uh, and as well uh, the Republic of South Africa. Just as a start, but I guarantee you it's not going to start. stop there. Given that we have a CEO from Bangladesh, hmm. globalism has no limits. Um, so, we, this is a new seminar, uh, this uh, small dialogue that we're having today, and obviously uh, we want to make sure that we're going to be exploring mutually beneficial relationships. Relationships, everyone talks about win-win. I love the word win-win. It just sounds so American and so correct. But the, but the reality is if you can look at situations that truly are with different parts of that APU system, everyone can actually benefit. This is one of those areas where the U.S. government could benefit from companies being more globally fluent, where companies certainly need to be more globally fluent, where the nonprofit organizations have a lot to contribute to that discussion. Literally, you go to every single part of that ecosystem, you're talking about a win-win situation across the spectrum. That's not often what you find. You usually find losers, actually, if you take a critical look at some of these partnerships. This is not in, in that particular category. So I want to talk a little bit about Deirdre because she's going to take the rest of the time and uh, it's going to do a lot, a lot better than I can in introducing the topic and, and bringing this to a point. Um, she's you know, obviously an expert in global economic development, uh, spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union, and, and, and you know, that's a segue to a little bit broader background. So she's CEO of uh, Pixera. Uh, she's uh, worked very much in, in global pro bono work. Uh, clearly, she's uh, been an advisor to IBM, Pfizer, uh, and a variety of other organizations that's out there. She's been widely quoted in Bloomberg, uh, Fast Company, Forbes, and other social media uh, giants and others. Um, and of course, you know, comes uh, through the Clinton Global Initiative, most recently before taking over this position, um, as a facilitator for the Employee Engagement Action Network at CGI. Um, but she's also served with the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, the Bellagio uh, Institute, and then also the Johnson Foundation. So, without any further ado, Deirdre, I'm going to hand it over to you. You've got more note cards than I do. So, <laughs> this is going to be really fun to hear from you and, and, and our colleagues here. And I guess I'll uh, have some words to say at the, at the very end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Idea of engagement is absolutely so 
critical to the success of all the work that we are trying to do to enrich lives and livelihoods, and it obviously is at the roots of all of the work of the Global Ties family, uh, and very much the idea of with versus to, and this idea of engagement is a part of all of our efforts we're going to talk about today. So without much further ado, uh, I want to... Speak up a little bit. We have Sorry, I didn't have the second microphone on. Is that a little better? <laughs> you didn't miss anything. <laughs> uh, without further ado, I'd actually like to turn the floor over to the first panelist, which is Gina Tesla from IBM. And I'm going to ask Gina, first of all, to tell a few words about herself and her role at IBM, and then to tell us about the Corporate Service Corps program. Gina, the Corporate Service Corps program is the largest corporate pro bono program, international corporate pro bono program out there. Uh, we've been delighted to work with you on it for the last five years, and it's just been an amazing experience of impact uh, uh, at the level of the organizations that are assisted on the ground, uh, at the level of the participants, uh, and I think at the level of the corporation as well. So can you tell us a little bit about the program and also it's your five year anniversary, it was your five year anniversary yeah. last year, how has it evolved over the past five years? Sure, I'm very happy to. And first of all, I'd like to thank Jennifer so much for inviting me here today and thank my fellow panelists. I'm really excited to be here and talk about the Corporate Service Corps. And a big thank you to Deirdre because as she mentioned, we are five years old and um, that may seem young, but in terms of the kind of the breadth of the work, which I'll show you in, in a minute, you can see that um, it's pretty extensive and we wouldn't be able to uh, accomplish all the things that we've been able to accomplish, namely serving people throughout the world if it wasn't for Deirdre and her organization. So thank you very much for all of your partnership and support. Um, so I think we'll move through a couple of slides. Deirdre asked uh, for me to tell you a little bit about IBM and, and my um, role at IBM. And so I'm part of our corporate citizenship group and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Sally Marietta. Um, and uh, she's the one who really makes it all happen. I just get to uh, sit up here and talk about the program. But Sally is, is a critical member of our team who is here um, in the region really implementing the programs that we have in corporate citizenship. And our philosophy is that corporate citizenship is really, or corporate responsibility, really takes place at the intersection between business and society. And there's no better example of that than the Corporate Service Corps program. I'm part of the group, but I'm based in our corporate headquarters, which are in Armand, New York. And I have the pleasure of leading this program. It's a great example of corporate responsibility and the intersection of business and society because we are really able to realize a triple benefit from this program. It's very sustainable because we're able to simultaneously engage our employees through this high class leadership development experience while also benefiting IBM by not only having employees who are better able to work in a globally integrated enterprise, but by also helping us learn more about the communities and the markets in which they're serving. And then, of course, the third benefit is really about the benefit to communities. And so, as Deirdre was mentioning before, this is a really high-skilled contribution that we're making to communities. And as I was mentioning the intersection of business and society, we really believe that we need to take a look at the capabilities and resources that we have within IBM and use those to design programs that are going to provide the, the biggest benefit for communities. And what better way to serve communities than to take our highest talented people and put them on projects which stretch them, which take them out of their comfort zone, and uh, give them an opportunity to really think about how they can help serve a community um, through some very high skill contributions. And so the program really enjoys a triple benefit, and that's why it's very sustainable, and that's why, as you can see, on the slide, we've had over 2,400 participants from over 52 countries. What that means is that in 52 countries, there are IBMers who have had a deeply immersive experience 
not only working in a country which they probably have never been to, or perhaps even a continent that they've never been to, but working with 10 to 15 of their colleagues from around IBM. So not only do they have the experience as one of my colleagues here, um, Dinah, <laughs> uh, who served in the Corporate Service Corps in India. So not only did she have the opportunity to learn more about India, but she had the opportunity to learn from her colleagues who were coming from all over the world. So for example, we're sending out a team now that has 15 people 14, from 14 different countries. And so there's the opportunity to learn what it's like to work in IBM in China or Costa Rica or uh, you, know, you, you name it of any of the 52 countries. And so when we talk about global connections, it's about connecting to the people that we're serving through this program, but also connecting to each other. We've had over 850 projects. So if we look conservatively at the number of people that we've been able to impact through the program, a conservative estimate is that we have directly impacted the lives of over 140,000 people with this program. And when I say conservatively, that means that if we look at programs that fall into the area of education or healthcare and extrapolate, then we're looking at a number that's much larger. But Specifically, directly looking at the projects that we've had, we've been able to connect with and support over 140,000 people in 34 countries at a value of about $56 million. Um, so it's clearly something that is very sustainable because we're able to, to really um, fulfill each of these three benefits. Oftentimes, there's a, there is a particular interest on the impact to employees, and this gives you a little bit of a taste of what employees say. So they come back from this experience, as one of my colleagues says, you have to peel them off the ceiling. They're talking about how this was uh, literally a life-changing experience. As I said, these are people who are coming from over 50 different countries and all different kinds of native languages, and somehow they all tend to use the same, the same expression of it being a life-changing experience. So we thought we would go out to them and see if that was still true five years later. And um, overwhelmingly, people are, are definitely came back and said that this was a, a tremendous experience for them from a leadership development perspective, as well as learning more about, about cultures and working together. And then we thought, let's ask the managers, because they're the ones that have to give these people up for a month. So our employees go through three months of free work, which is virtual, and then they're on the ground for a month. So what would a manager who's losing their top talent say? And it turned out that the managers were saying that they would recommend this program to one of their other employees. So I think that's a, that's a very significant statement, particularly in this business climate, um, where you know we we everyone is, is asked to do even more with less, and um, it's pretty significant that the managers say yes, that this is something that was really, truly benefit, uh, beneficial for, for um, my employees. So that's a little bit of an overview of the program. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little how it's changed over the five years? Sure. So the way that it's changed over the five years is that in the beginning, we were very much focused on, as you can imagine, um, there's an opportunity cost to having a program which is so large. We have um, an annual application process, and we get thousands of applications every year. And so we chose to have a program where we had um, a pretty large um, kind of breadth of, of programs. And so it took us a while to really make sure that we could create a well-oiled machine um, that was operating very effectively. And of course, as I mentioned before, Pixera and our other partners are a key, a key part of, of that operational success. And so I think that we were kind of more focused on that, really scaling up the program in the beginning. And now what we're more focused on is taking a deeper look at the impact that we're making on communities. That's one aspect. And so we, what we're doing is really being very innovative and taking a look and saying, you know, what, what kind of difference are we making in these communities? And we tend to find that generally that falls into a few different categories. That we tend to be um, a catalyst for change. We tend to um, support capacity building. We tend to bring a lot of awareness to an organization and the issues that they're, that they're facing. 
So one of the ways that we're changing is by really taking a look at the impact that we're making and using that to help advance the program uh, moving forward. The other thing that we've done, which I think is really key, is this whole notion of citizen diplomacy and really looking at how we can use this very significant resource that we're providing, how we can even, how we can kind of extrapolate the benefits of that by working with key partners. For example, we work closely with the State Department and with USAID, with PEPFAR, and with our colleagues at a variety of different companies who are interested in this type of, of um, contribution. And so one of the ways that we're evolving and changing is really taking a look at what are some of the issues, societal issues, that we can help address, not alone as an, as an individual corporation, but rather in partnership with um, or the organizations that I mentioned and more, and that we see that that really helps to drive di deeper impact and have a more sustainable um, uh, impact and benefit for the communities that we're serving. So as we do that impact analysis, we're really seeing that we want to have even more partnerships and drive even greater value for um, communities. So that's a little bit of how we're changing. Okay. So Manuja Juneja is the Mike. engagement manager. Here comes that word again. Sorry about the microphone. The Global Engagement Manager at GlaxoSmithKline. And Manu, the GlaxoSmithKline program uh, is similar to IBM's in that it's a cross-border model, um, and similar to IBM's in that it's very focused on sustainable change, both in the communities and sustainable change in the people that participate in bringing that change back to, to GSK. But it's a much longer term uh, program in terms of how long your, your people are in the field. So can you tell us a little bit about your program and, and what it looks like? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Deirdre, and thank you, Jennifer, for having us here. Um, so just to give you an overview, um, our program is called the Buzz Volunteer Partnership. And um, the idea is really that we send employees, up to 100 employees, to work with nonprofit partners for up to six months um, every year. Um, the program was started with the vision of our um, new, then new CEO, Andrew Pitti, who joined GSK now in 2008. And um, he decided to announce the program to the surprise of the rest of his team at an employee broadcast, where he said, um, when a lot of companies uh, were going through recession and the whole economy was going through recession, he said, well, we're looking at cutting down spends on our CSR budget, where we cannot spend as much. Um, let's initiate a program that can actually help make a sustainable difference within communities and within nonprofit partners. So this was really his idea and his vision. And uh, we are actually calling Eugene, we are at our fourth year mark. Uh, so it's been four years, and we've sent up to 400 employees from 45 different countries, serving with 70 different nonprofit partners in more than 50 so we are really diverse. Um, I guess one key difference between our program and IBM's is that we send individuals uh, working on individual projects. We typically don't send teams. Um, uh, I guess the mission is, uh, again, it's very really similar. It's three-fold mission. So um, because we are sending people to help support skills these projects, for example, an R&D scientist within GSK would go and help on clinical trials in Africa. Um, example, a supply chain expert within GSK would be helping a nonprofit partner that is distributing vaccines um, in, in many parts of the world. Similarly, a marketing expert would go and help with branding and strategic marketing, etc. So really the idea is that the, the employee will be able to create a sustainable change within the community. So that's really the first part of the mission. The second part is really about, about the employee himself or herself, so the individual. And of course, this kind of experience, especially if it's an international one, will lead to um, significant development. So we see a lot of employees coming back and saying they really see a change in, in their own behavior, so the, you know, their leadership or flexibility or creativity or doing more with less. Um, and of course, the third part, which I think is really close to the heart of our mission, is changing GSK. Um, we are a very big company, um, 100,000 employees um, in, in 70 different countries, and so what comes with that kind of an organization is that we are highly complex in our processes. 
um, to the extent that we are pure critic. Mm -hmm. And um, our CEO's vision in, in sort of setting up this program was that when these employees come back from non-profit partners from these great experiences, they can actually bring that culture back into GSK. They can, they can cut down some of the complexity. So a lot of employees who come back really would say, well, why do we send so many emails? Why do I have 100 emails in my inbox every day? So simple things like that, I think, are changing our company. And it's been four years. We are seeing that change is sort of creating a ripple effect, not only among the employees who are back, but also among their teams. Um, you know, they're, they're using less and less resources, et cetera. So that's really our threefold mission. Um, and I guess that the idea here was to use a video, but we are not using it. But that's our CEO announcing the program back in 2008. And um, Deirdre, you asked me some of the some of the unique aspects of the program is uh, it's really a full time immersion. So employees are sent for up to six months. They, they have two options really. They can choose a three or six month assignment. Um, it's a uh, you could choose a home assignment as well as international. And by that, what it means is that you might be based in Washington D.C. and you have family, so you really cannot leave them and go for six months working in Africa. So we have opportunities, local opportunities, working with non-profit partners here in Washington, D.C. for employees who want to do local assignments. And uh, so we see a split between our international assignments to, to almost 65 or 45, and we are actually moving that to almost 50-50, um, as we are seeing it through the years. Um, it, is a, it is a program that is championed by our CEO and our CET, our corporate executive team. So not only when we started the program, but every year, our CEO makes it a point that he needs volunteers wherever he can. Um, he steps into, uh, when we match volunteers to the NGO needs, he will step into those processes and asks, asks us how it is all going. He's extremely interested in, in the impact of our program as well. So um, it's really with his vision and his, um, I guess, championing of the program that it, it is still up and running and we are sending more and more employees every year. Um, Another key differentiator is that we sit within the HR team in GSK. So I report into, into a team that is called the Talent Leadership and Organization Development Team. And why it sits within HR and not you know, a CSR team is really because it speaks to the last two missions that you saw on the first slide, which is for the employee itself, it's a big change. And for GSK itself, it's a big change. So we really want to you know, uh, make sure that people understand that, and that's why we are we are based within HR. We see a lot of benefit from just being based in HR. Um, we are managed in house, um, so so we do partner with uh, Pixera, and uh, you know we consult with them, etc. But we try to manage all of our operations end to end in house. We are a five member team, and um, we run this globally. Um, and um, I guess much like IBM, we do we do a lot of metrics collection. Um, the stats that I saw on your slide, Trina, were very similar to the to the stats that we see. Um, you know, where employees come back, and you know, 99 percent would say, I would love to do do this program again. It was a life changing experience. Line managers and their teams say they see a significant change in the attitude and motivation of the people that are coming back. And um, we collect like metrics at the uh, NGO level as well. So we serve nonprofit partners not only at the end of the volunteers' assignment, but also six months after to really just track whether there was a sustainable change or whether it was just one time. So that's pretty much it from me. Thank you. That's amazing. The uh, next person we're going to hear from is Kevin from the Mitsubishi Foundation. And I think what's really interesting here is you've heard the model from IBM that's all cross-border. Uh, you've heard the model from GSK, which has cross-border immersive opportunities as well as local immersive opportunities. And now you hear from Kevin about a more local model as well. And it's one that Kevin referred to uh, when talking with us prior to this meeting as shared value philanthropy. So as you tell us about your program, can you tell us a little more about that concept and how this program aligns with the business strategy of Mitsubishi? Absolutely, happy to do that. And so a pleasure to be here today. I feel like I've come home. I, I know several people in the room. I used to work with the CIB and the National Program Agency and on the board of NCIB, now Global Ties USA. So it's a pleasure to, to be here home again. <laughs> And a uh, pleasure to be here representing the Mitsubishi Electric America Foundation. Uh, I'm the director of the foundation. And um, we are the philanthropic arm of the Mitsubishi Electric Corporation here in the United States. Um, so I really want to focus in on 
um, U.S. engagement and cooperation. So, first of all, Mitsubishi. Um, what do we make? Who here knows what we make? Trevor, what do you make? Big electrical power plants. Very good, excellent. So we're Mitsubishi Electric. So there's another company out there called Mitsubishi Motors uh, that makes some cars. And um, that's our, our cousin, actually. So we're a separate entity from Mitsubishi Motors. We share the Three Diamond logo. But we do think, make things like uh, electrical products, uh, solar panels. We make diamond vision displays you might find at the Dallas Cowboy Stadium. Um, we make elevators and escalators and HVAC equipment and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, robot arms and all kinds of neat electrical equipment. And um, I guess that's one of the points, though, when you're making connections and engaging with a company is really know the company that you're working with, know what they're involved in, know what their footprint is. Um, we are actually a fairly small company here in the United States, even though we're a big global corporation. We only have about 2,500 employees with Mitsubishi Electric. So uh, you might think of us as more of a small business when you start looking regionally at our different locations. So the foundation. Um, like I mentioned, we're the Mitsubishi Electric America Foundation, so we serve the uh, philanthropic and volunteer programs here in the United States. And our mission is to uh, empower young people with disabilities to lead productive lives. So a very focused, narrow mission as an organization. And uh, again, if, if you're trying to partner with us um, and you're coming to us for a car, you're not going to find that with us. You, know, you want to find a program that's helping young people and helping to empower them so they can lead, lead productive lives. Uh, just a few examples here. The one in the middle, uh, you might recognize the guy on the right, um, but the, the young man in the wheelchair uh, is an intern in the American Association of People with Disabilities uh, Congressional Energy Program, and he was an intern for Senator Obama back when he was senator. And um, that's what we do. We fund programs that are helping to provide real life experiences for young people with disabilities. Uh, another program we support is called the U.S. International Council on Disability Energy Program. And some of those interns have actually interned at uh, World Learning and some other national program agencies here in D.C. And as we look at our programs, um, th this idea of shared value philanthropy, it's a fairly new concept. Uh, actually, I think it was even founded by Medtronic um, as, a, as a concept and an idea. It's really moving from the idea of checkbook philanthropy that a lot of companies used to do and moving more toward aligning um, your corporate giving programs, your volunteer programs with overall company goals. And you've heard examples here already of um, what companies are trying to achieve by engaging their employees, getting them out in the world, learning about other cultures, but also sharing uh, the experience from their companies and ultimately helping to further the company's goals and agenda. We're still moving along this track of, um, of shared value philanthropy. Um, we haven't aligned totally. We're a, we're a separate foundation from the company, so there's some self-dealing rules we have to, to work with. But overall, we are trying to align what we do with our, um, with our overall goals as a corporation with our corporate social responsibility goals. And so globally, our goals are focused on the environment, environmental preservation, science and technology, and social welfare. Well, again, working with young people with disabilities here in the United States, that obviously fits in that social welfare category. And that's a title from Japan, by the way. I know it's not very popular here in the United States, but, but uh, we, we help social welfare um, and help young people with disabilities. But we have crossover with uh, science technology and environment because we're trying to encourage young people to gain skills and knowledge and uh, pursue careers, uh, STEM careers, and uh, careers uh, with the environment. So just a quick example, kind of a localized example of uh, how to develop a relationship with a company and how to really maximize that relationship and think about the shared value approach. So like I mentioned, we make a little thing, a little solar panel here. And um, one of our volunteer employees worked with an organization called Grid Alternatives based in <coughs> Southern California. And Grid Alternatives places solar panels on the home of low-income housing and uh, to help reduce the overall energy costs for families. So uh, our volunteer who's up there in the left-hand corner, Allison, 
she came to the foundation and said, hey, is there something we could do to partner together and think about how we can use our products um, and use the idea of energy efficiency, but also help young people with disabilities? And we did just that. So they partnered with Cal State Long Beach, recruited some students with disabilities to come out and become uh, trained in, in volunteerism. And they worked alongside our employee volunteers doing skill-based volunteerism, installing solar panels in the home of, of low-income housing. And um, ultimately, they had a great time, of course. But it's a way to, to develop that relationship. So the Grid Alternatives, the nonprofit organization, was able to get volunteer support for something they were trying to achieve. Product donations. Um, they were uh, also able to help the company achieve its goals. Our goal as an organization is to help empower young people with disabilities. And ultimately, of course, help the families that Great Alternatives is trying to serve. And they also got some grant money to go along with it because we paid for volunteer hours as a foundation. So it's a, a real nice partnership that oh, we can maybe talk more about a little bit. But I just want to give that idea that shared value philanthropy as you engage with corporations, you know, find out what their interests are, think about what you do, and where is that alignment as you build those partnerships. Thank you. Well, uh, you just gave me a great lead-in to the next, uh, the next topic area. One thing that we heard from each of the panelists was how critical partnerships are to the success of their work and partnerships that go across sectors, uh, whether they are corporate social sector partnerships like some of the ones we discussed and also uh, looking at where government comes into this and, and how we have successful partnerships that cross all three of those sectors. And I know uh, in the case, Gene, in the case of IBM, you have uh, a very complex set of partners that work on the Corporate Service Corps program. You have implementing partners such as ourselves. You have local organizations on the ground that are very well known to your, to your country offices. And then you also are working with new organizations that IBM has never met or heard of in the past. So I imagine that has a quite a level of richness to it, but I also know that it has a lot of challenges uh, as well. Can you share with us some of those challenges and how you manage those at IBM? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think when faced with a challenge, the way that we're able to really overcome it is by looking at some of our foundational elements. So with the Corporate Service Corps, it's the foundational elements of the triple benefit, and that really helps ground us. And so we're, when we're facing a particular issue or making a decision, we go back to the triple benefit. One of the other foundational principles that we have are our IBM values. And one of our values, we have three values, and one of them is about trust and personal responsibility in all relationships. And that's really a key element of this program. Ultimately, this program is all about human beings. It's all about people helping other people and having these cultural exchanges. And I've talked a lot about how the IBMers are helping communities on the ground. Well, the IBMers are also getting support. They're also learning from the people that they're working with. So it's really important for us to establish a basis of, of trust. I think that that's one of the, the key elements. And so I mentioned the, the key partnership that I have with Deirdre and her team. And it's really important that we trust each other because I'm relying on them to be the eyes and the ears on the ground for the entirety of the assignment. And I have to know that I can trust them to bring issues to me um, as they start to bubble up so that we can address them immediately. So that's one element, is really having and establishing that trust. I think the second thing is really clearly laying out our objectives. That's another really important point. So we're very clear about what we're trying to accomplish with this program. And we work uh, together in the strategic development of the program so that in those situations where I'm relying on Deirdre and her team to make some judgment calls on the fly, they're doing that based on their knowledge of the strategic direction of the program. So everybody's kind of starting from the same page, and that's a really strong base to make a variety of different decisions. And then the third thing is communications. I think it's all about making sure that we're talking um, and on a regular basis, of course, we have all of our regular cadence calls, but making sure that there is a mechanism for communication. 
oftentimes, you know, as I said, this is all about people helping people. Well, this is also about people or IBMers who, for some of whom, maybe didn't even have a passport before. And so sometimes there are, are issues that come up like culture shock. And when culture shock comes up, people don't raise their hands and say, oh, I'm having culture shock. You know, it kind of manifests itself in different ways. And so having communication among all the different participants and parties really helps um, prevent, really, any sort of issues from coming up. And then when they do come up, it's really important for us to continue to kind of have that basis of trust, know what we're, our, our objectives are of the program, and to have that, that level of, of communication. I think the last thing I'll say about that is really about Pixera is also representing us with the organizations that, that we're serving. So they're going on the ground and finding the local organizations that we're going to be serving. And so it's really important that they're able to effectively communicate what, where, the reason why we have this program, the fact that it is a very highly skilled contribution. Um, because if you put yourself in the shoes of the organizations, they must be wondering, you know, really? <laughs> IBM, really, they're going to come for four weeks and they're really going to work with us. And, and so, you know, it's not necessarily an easy task to really clearly describe um, the type of work and the contribution that we're going to be making. So I think that there's a little bit of faith <laughs> um, on behalf of the organizations. They're not exactly sure what is going to, you know, who's going to be coming. And I think the same thing on, on behalf of the participants. They're not really exactly sure what the heck they've gotten themselves into. So I think the fact that everybody is approaching this from a solid ground really helps us with some of those challenges. Thank you. And Kevin, you outlined a program for us that depends heavily on the partners to develop the projects um, and to bring to you projects that are feasible, <coughs> that are good projects that meet your needs. How do you ensure that that happens, and what do you do when it doesn't? What do we do when it doesn't? We, <laughs> we hide our heads and cry. Um, yeah, of course, you know, as, as nonprofit executives, you all know how difficult it is to uh, get volunteers and, um, and to set up volunteer programs. And um, it's imperative that, that the volunteer program really be set up well. Um, again, the, the Grid Alternatives example I gave uh, one of the keys to that, of course, is having a champion in the company, um, Allison, our employee volunteer, and um, you know, really starting with that champion, really working with them to figure out what the capabilities of the company are, what are they willing to do. Our company, unfortunately, doesn't pay for, for four-week opportunities to go abroad, um, unless you're a Japanese executive traveling around the world. Um, but um, you know, what, what is feasible for the company to to work on what can what volunteer opportunities are there um, that you have, and then identifying the expectations, outlining those expectations, identifying the roles and responsibilities, um, and you know, what the time frame is and so forth, and a realistic uh, lead time to, to set the program up. All those things are just, of course, good project management. Um, and too often we go to even some longtime partners. Um, where we, we take groups of 50 volunteers out for a day to um, work at a camp for kids with disabilities, for example, and there's nothing to do. And um, so it's really imperative for our, our volunteer leaders in the company to work with the uh, program coordinators out of the nonprofit organizations to um, really identify what needs to be done, what resources are there. And one of the things to think about as you partner and engage with companies are, are there things you need for the project to be successful? And you can ask the company and see if there are, um, are things. For example, again, like I said, we match volunteer hours. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies have dollar for doer programs, and that money could be used to purchase materials for the project and those types of things. So, um, so keep that in mind to be sure to, it doesn't hurt to ask, okay, so I'm trying to say, for um, what you need for a project to be successful. But it's imperative, absolutely imperative, that the um, the expectations are well outlined, and the company knows what the organization expects, and vice versa. So, um, yeah. Thank you. 
So, and then in a little bit of a different model, Manu, you said four years. So four years, 70 NGOs, 56 countries, and you're managing this all in-house by five people. That's a lot of partnerships. How do you manage those partnerships, and what are some of your learnings from having had such a diverse sector with a section of partners? So when we started, we had a lot of partners. Um, the first year when our CEO announced the program and um, you know he really just asked the team to roll it out, I guess our starting point was reaching out to all of our corporate responsibility teams across the globe and saying, what are some of the key nonprofit partners that you guys work with? And of course, we received this list of massive list of 100 and more nonprofit partners from around the world. And it was really hard for us to really choose and um, you know select the right partners because we are serving a very different need. Um, it's not like um, probably just providing funds or medicines. We were looking at partners who had the real need. Um, we are an NGO need driven program, and by that, what I mean is that we um, ask our nonprofit partners at every year because we run on an annual cycle, and we say. Do you need a skill or a talent um, that you otherwise cannot afford or cannot find in, in the country or region where you are in? So somebody would come back and say, hey, actually, we, we have been thinking about the strategic planning process for a few years now. We can't get this done because we really don't have the talent. Do you have somebody in GSK who can help us with that? So we are really looking for the genuine need. Um, and what happens in some of these cases is that uh, nonprofit partners will often accept volunteers, but when volunteers go there, you know, like you were saying, Kevin, they might not have, you know, work to do. So um, one of the learnings uh, we've had over the years is we try to do it, um, you know, step check. Uh, so at 30 days after the volunteer joins the nonprofit, we do a check-in call, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one check-in call with the volunteer, really just to see what they're doing. And then um, we also invite their local nonprofit partner on that call. So really, I think that check-in helps a lot because it's been 30 days. Um, what's what's the scope of your assignment? Do you have deliverables? Um, we use um, you know our own internal templates, our performance development templates. We hand it over to employees. They you have to instruct your NGO manager to really fill this out. So all that's almost like following your development as you're going through that six-month assignment as well. And we ask them, have you filled out the PDP form? Um, you know, do, do you have set deliverables both um, in terms of what you will deliver on the assignment, but also in terms of how you progress on your, um, you know, behavior qualities. So those checking calls have really helped. I think that's that's our number one learning. Um, number two, I would say, over the years, uh, we've learned that you know we cannot spread ourselves too thin. So we've really focused in on partners that have worked well with us. Um, so we asked our volunteers how their experience was, you know, were they supported well when they were at the uh, local organization. Um, but then we get a sense from these check-in calls as well. And of course, when we run the surveys, we are able to see which nonprofit partners are still sustaining the impact of the volunteers. Um, we don't want that impact to be lost after the leave. So we have to make some hard decisions at the end of every year because we say we want to work with this partner, but actually they are probably not a great partner to be sending our employees to. So from that, I don't know, the massive list that we started, this year, for example, we are just working with 45 nonprofit partners. And 45, again, they look like a lot, you know, a, a huge number, but um, given the fact that we do have employees from all over the world, there could be someone from India wanting to do a little assignment to be sure that there are opportunities available. Um, so I guess those would be the two key okay. Thank you. Well, I think one thing that really came across in that conversation, and I think that we don't pay enough attention to as a community, is that partnerships are really difficult. There's a lot of challenges. Every office around here, USAID, the State Department, uh, IFC, state government offices, everyone now has a partnerships office and everyone wants to be in a good partnership. But I think we really don't acknowledge that a good partnership is really difficult. And if your partnership is all smooth sailing from day one, um, maybe it's not a real partnership and maybe not everyone is, is, is getting the full benefit that they would like to out of the partnership. So, let me ask the panelists to say one more word about partnerships. If you have one tip for the people in the room about partnership, uh, what's difficult about partnership, how to overcome those difficulties, anything that comes to mind, could you?
could you share it with the audience now? I'll start with uh, Kevin down there, if that's okay. I knew you were going to start with me. It's difficult about partnerships. Um, to, I think it was mentioned earlier, just building that trust um, and building the trust between the organizations. And like I mentioned, starting small is um, a good place to start and uh, demonstrate that trust, demonstrate you can follow through on both, uh, both parties' counts. Because um, oftentimes we as the company are the ones that drop the ball because we get you know, busy doing our, our, what we get paid for, I guess, and sometimes the volunteer aspects of what we do um, fall by the wayside. So it's important to build trust in both, both uh, parties' accounts. Let's go from there. Certainly, I, I agree on that point about trust, as I was mentioning before. And I think that I'd like to add on to what Deirdre was saying, that innovation and great ideas don't always come from agreements. And that it is important to have a partner who's going to be honest and who is going to um, Kind of join us in our spirit of continuous improvement and kind of bring up some of the points that might be a little bit difficult to raise. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to come to us and say, well, you know, we're kind of having this, this issue. Uh, there's the, the, more, the more kind of direct, you know, logistical issue that has to be dealt with, but there are also some issues that a good partner will feel comfortable raising. And if you have that trust and you have that rapport, then I think that they'll come to you and, and if you open up that door to constructive criticism, then I think that you'll hear it. And so I think it's really important to try to um, kind of have that, that relationship where you can give that respect, respective constructive criticism. I agree with um, the two panelists here. I guess just to add, um, one thing that we've seen significantly affects the partnerships that we have is that they are so people dependent. Um, so we, like I said, we are a five-member team. We, um, you know, try and serve all of our global employees, which means that we would have phone calls with folks in Ghana or India or Bangladesh. And what happened, what has happened naturally over the years is that one person within the team is speaking to, let's say, 20 different nonprofit partners and manages the relationship. The day that one person changes from either side of the party, the relationship goes away. And that has been, I guess, what's the biggest barrier. How do we continue those partnerships despite the you know, constant change in, in the key contacts of both sides of the organization? Once again, the last words couldn't have been a better lead into uh, the next uh, the next change of topics. This idea of of developing relationships and one concept that I want to discuss a little bit here is this idea of global fluency. Uh, and this is a term we use at Pixar Global as distinct from cultural competency. So. I lived in Russia for nine years. I speak fluent Russian. I'm culturally competent in things Russia. But I'm a globally fluent person in that you can take me and drop me down now in pretty much any environment and I'll figure out how to make my way around and most importantly how to develop relationships in that environment. And as an organization, Pixar Global, we are focused on bringing together public, private, and social sector to enrich lives and livelihoods. And most of that work is very much in this intersect with business space. And so as we were looking at our own portfolio a couple of years ago, we really realized that we were missing an element where we have the, 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 the skills to help to develop global fluency. Uh, about uh, 18 months ago, we decided to join forces with the US Center for Citizen Diplomacy. Uh, and I'll point out Diane Rasmussen, who's the director of the US Center in the audience, uh, as well as Tom Giddens, who's our Washington representative. One of the reasons that we decided to do that was because we understood that while we lived at this intersect of, of business and government and the social sector um, and bringing business solutions, that people have to become globally fluent in a way that's comfortable to them at a particular moment. And so the work that NCIB is doing and the work that USCCD can support uh, is allowing people to start that uh, start on that path to 
for global fluency, whether it's in going to a local exhibition at uh, at your museum, at your local museum on Japanese culture, whether it's home hosting, or whether it's student exchange, uh, whether it's at the high school level or at the college level. I mean, there's so many different ways to get your first taste of global engagement. In some cases, your first case, taste of global engagement is when your company sends you to Tanzania for six months. Uh, but there's many ways to do that. And so we, have, we decided to work with the US Center to really drive forward this idea of global fluency and to provide tools and resources for the organizations like Global Ties that are on the ground uh, doing the hard, the, the, the hard lifting on this, this front every day. So I just wanted to, uh, to raise that issue for a second and then take the conversation back to the panel on this idea of global fluency and how important that is to your corporations and how that maybe plays in, into your programming. Uh, Manu, you talked about one of the critical things being about sustainable change of your employees. Where does global fluency come into that sense of change? Sure, I love that term by the way, global fluency. Um, so yeah, changing employees is really um, core to our mission and um, by that what we mean is that when employees come back from this um, six month enriching experience, they would say that they have changed, um, you know, in, in, in ways that serve them better and serve GSK better. So they would say they come back with a global perspective. They would say they have um, a sense of the, um, the emerging markets and how they work, for example. Um, and, and we do do the metrics collection, um, and we've seen that uh, employees who participated in the past program have 21% uh, more chances or more likelihood to do a secondment or to change their role after they immediately come back from their assignments because now they cannot stay still. They might have been in GSK in the same world for 10 years, but after doing this experience, they want to move, they want to go to another country, they want to experience something totally different. Um, and I actually uh, have a great uh, example inside. A close colleague of mine based in Philadelphia, um, he is an IT analyst in GSK and had been so for eight years. And um, um, you know, whenever he would meet me, he would say, I'm a typical American. I've never gone outside of the US. I didn't need to. He didn't even have a passport. Um, unfortunately, a few years back, he was diagnosed with a certain kind of leukemia. And um, you know, it's then that he decided that he had to do something different and new with his life. Um, he says, um, I had to get busy living or get busy dying. So he decided to apply for the FOSS program um, and he said, I want to do an international assignment because I don't know where my life will lead me. Um, he was matched to um, an NGO uh, in Kisumu, Kenya. So imagine a typical American <laughs> who never traveled going to Kisumu, Kenya, an IT analyst. Um, and he uh, was serving the Oprah Foundation in Kisumu to really help with their IT infrastructure. They have a lot of paper in their uh, office and in, in Kenya where all the medical records are in files. So, and every file he describes, like every file has a color. So if you're pregnant, you're in the pink colored file. If you have HIV, you're in the blue colored file, you know, and so on and so forth. So his job really there was to convert all of this paper and all of these files into electronic, um, you know, a tablet system, which will really help make the medical system more efficient. Now, of course, he, he did all that, um, you know, and, and he was at least able to start, you know, that project, and we do keep sending volunteers for the same projects. But, I mean, the amount of change that he brought back with himself, after six months, I met him, and he was a totally changed man. He said, I have two families, one in Kenya, <laughs> and uh, one here in America, and, um, you know, every time I meet him, it just reminds me of, uh, you know, how, how this program really helps change employees and their perspective, and how important it is for for us in GSK to be, to really do that. I love sending people like that. <laughs> it's just fascinating. Uh, Kevin, so your corporation's a, a little different here in that it was uh, started and headquartered in Japan, even though it's a very global corporation. So talk a little bit about how that changes your conception of global fluency and how important that is in Mitsubishi Electric's leaders. Absolutely, yeah. We're always a little different, I guess. But, um, so yeah, as a multinational corporation based in Japan, um, we have a need for global fluency, but it's uh, a little different, I think, from, from an American perspective, because our, like I mentioned, our Japanese executives traveling. You know, every three to five years, we have a new 
crop of executives that come to the United States um, that lead our companies and work in our companies um, from Japan. And of course, that they're gaining global fluency in different markets because they do that all over the world. Um, and, uh, and that's what they're doing to, to learn about, of course, the marketplaces where we do business and sell. And um, our U.S. executives um, occasionally will go back to Japan, occasionally do other, of course, business travels around the world. Um, but, of course, their focus is, and I think it's important to, to remember, their focus is trying to build a business and sell in the United States. So they're interested in making connections here in the United States. So as you think about um, your CIBs, your organizations, you know, what can you do to reach out to and engage uh, multinational companies that would help make connections in the local community? Of course, that's what you're all good at. And um, particularly for, you know, in our case, our Japanese expatriate employees and their families, how can you bring them in, educate them, and introduce them to the local community, um, as well as, uh, of course, for our, our U.S. Uh, employees and counterparts, we have a huge need for global fluency and a huge need to uh, get our um, employees engaged. So as you as you make those inroads amongst uh, amongst multinational companies and and work with uh, the executives, you can introduce the employees also to opportunities for global fluency by hosting people in your own backyards as we do. So um, I think that's a little different when we think about making connections with foreign companies is that we, um, yeah, we need to, they, they, we're the foreigners, they're coming here to learn about us, so, um, yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, Gina, IBM's made an enormous commitment to this idea of leadership development through international corporate service, but also has made a real commitment to, to the idea of creating globally fluent leaders not just through cross-border exchange, but also even in the makeup of your teams, which are so multinational. Tell us a little bit about why this is so important to IBM and what effect you're seeing. Well, it's critical to IBM, and it's really why the program was created. Um, our chairman and CEO, Sam Palmasano, created the program because it was a unique way for us to grow leaders who would be able to excel in a globally integrated enterprise. And we have nearly 450,000 employees, and we're operating in somewhere around 170 different countries. And so it's critical that we have employees who can function very effectively in this sort of environment. And this is a terrific way, as, as I mentioned before, and as Deirdre was mentioning, for our employees to not only learn about the countries and the communities that they're serving through the program, but to learn about each other. They begin their pre-work, they have virtual pre-work for three months, and so they begin to get to learn about each other during that um, pre-work experience. And I should also mention it's cultural diversity, but it's also diversity among the various disciplines within the company. So we have people who are working together researchers, we have marketers, we have lawyers, financial analysts and leaders. We have people who are coming from every, consultants, can't leave them out, who are coming from every kind of walk of life, if you will, within, within our corporation and are learning about each other's respective functions as well as their respect, respective cultures. They're also representing a pretty wide age range. We have employees who have been with us for two years, and up to employees who have been with us for 25 years or more, or employees who are um, at the beginning stage of their career, employees who are more toward the end of their career, and, and at all kinds of different um, professional levels. And so it's really important, I think, for those people to spend some time together, not just on a conference call. If you work at IBM, you know how to, how to uh, be part of a conference call. But it's so much different to really see each other face to face, to interact, to have to sort out the things like, OK, well, where do we want to go as a team for dinner? Or where are we going to go um, on the weekend? What sort of cultural activity are we going to do? Or how are we going to sort out this problem? You know, you're being thrown into a situation where you have to figure out um, a challenge in a, in a 
really pretty short period of time. Going into a culture, for example, going into Brazil, and to be expected to um, immerse yourself in a culture where in the beginning of every meeting, you're generally spending, you know, 20 minutes at least having a, a cup of coffee and talking about the national, you know, football team or whatever. Um, you know, how can you get it, especially as an American, I can speak for myself, you know, how are you going to get anything done um, in four weeks if I have to sit around and have all these conversations? And that's something that you can really only understand from having that personal experience. I say from my own personal experience of being a Peace Corps volunteer and having the gift of, of serving in the Peace Corps and living in, in Panama for two years. And so I have an understanding, you know, when I'm encountering uh, a challenge, let's say, at work, I can kind of go back to putting myself in, in the shoes of somebody who maybe is experiencing a culture in a brand new a, a brand new way um, really stepping out of their their comfort zone and so I have an appreciation for kind of designing a program where there are some some intentional discomfort and I think that as as we were talking about um, the types of people who really benefit from this program sometimes it is the people who are having the most difficult time and frankly being the biggest pain um, because they're freaking out about something that's really not such a big deal. It's really just kind of culture shock manifesting itself. And so once you have gone through that experience, I think that you've learned so much more and that you approach that next, kind of when you come home, you approach that next meeting differently. You know, you think about the people who are on the other end of the phone and their different cultural kind of nuances and experiences. And maybe you do take a little bit of extra time to tell a story or to ask how somebody is doing. And, and you also not only have that, that kind of understanding about what it's like to work with different cultures, but you also have a network of uh, very special uh, friends because you've gone through this experience together and we see that our participants um, get together on an annual basis sometimes and they'll go back to their the place where they served or they'll visit each other. And so it's really, tight bond and to be effective in a large enterprise you need to have a network you need to be able to really effectively work the network because none of us are given a challenge and given an infinite amount of time to work on it we're given challenges that have to be solved now and the way that you do that is by reaching out to your network i never start anything with a clean sheet of paper literally or electronically, because I know that somewhere else in the company somebody's already thought of it or started it or has information that can help me um, create an even, even better solution to a particular challenge or create something new. And so the way that I can do that effectively is by leveraging my network and knowing how to comfortably reach out to someone who maybe I don't know but who I, who I found through my network. So I think having those sorts of skills and knowing how to reach out to people, to effectively work with people um, who are quite different from you in many different ways is an absolutely essential skill for us. And last but not least, is definitely critical in serving our clients. And so having employees who really know how to effectively listen um, which is so important, not arrive at a, at a problem with a predetermined response, but to know how to kind of sit down and listen and work collaboratively and understand somebody, else, somebody else's perspective really makes um, an engaged employee who can really provide the best service for our clients. Thank you. I, I remember a few years ago IBM referring to the experience as the people that participated learned how to learn how to work anywhere. And I think that's such a great concept. Not we learned how to work anywhere, we learned how to learn how to work anywhere. And I think what we heard from all the panelists here, not just about the cross-border aspects where they, where they exist, but also about the cross-sectoral aspects about working with another sector in different sizes and types of organizations, that, that the people that participate in these types of employee engagement programs, these types of corporate service programs, Learn how to learn how to work anywhere, and learn how to learn how to develop relationships anywhere. And it's just it, when you say win-win, it just there, there's no better way to, to describe it than that. 
We, uh, because we lost a panelist, I think we have a couple minutes to take a question, if that's okay. Come take a couple of questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, I'm Nina Boyd from the World Trade Center Institute in Baltimore. Question, I'm a little, uh, I'm curious to learn a little more about the, the logistics, about the house of this program. So where, who pays for them? Are employees um, pay their regular wages all year abroad? Are they staying home with families and hotels? And how does this work? Organizations being 
in some way involved with you or contribute to what you're doing or have in your uh, people, maybe feed into our network, how can we engage our people? Uh, one thing that just occurred to me in a way was that you're, you're the alumni of your programs overseas could be a resource for our memberships and our volunteers and that sort of thing. I noticed, for example, that all three of your organizations have locations in Boston or Cambridge, which is close to us. Kevin and Kevin's had a great outreach for, for uh, getting handicapped children out of the doors up there. And, uh, so that starts to spark ideas. How can we actually engage you from our network? Yeah, we're, we're really happy to do that. And, and it's, again, a win-win situation because our alumni um, have a taste of this experience and this cultural exchange and, and want more of it. And so it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to take our employees who've had this experience and who are interested in doing more um, and to have some of these, for example, round tables as a start to kind of think of um, some ideas and ways that they might be involved um, in the organization. And I think that, you know, thinking creatively, we should also think about our employees who might not be able to have this sort of experience for one reason or another, and how could they kind of working with an organization like yours, how could they maybe engage in some sort of cultural exchange locally, um, since they're not able to be part of the program. Kevin, since you're so familiar with the global size structure, do you want to comment on that? Sure, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about a couple of different things. Um, Manu, you mentioned several times that a small staff, and uh, I think that's probably a benefit that Global Ties could, could bring a little bit, is you know, helping on the on the front end of some of the logistics with the employees that are going overseas. That might be something that uh, a CIV could participate in. But more on the back end of both programs, um, and thinking about you know, a lot of people that have those international experiences, they come home to America, right? And um, where can they find like-minded people to interact with? Where can they engage? Where can they present on their experiences overseas? Um, so providing a forum for those uh, the, the participants to to present, to engage, to network, to host people when they, um, of course, have people coming from Kenya and other countries um, to the to the community. So I'd say that's a great way. And just speaking for uh, Mitsubishi Electric in our programs, you mentioned having young people with disabilities, uh, doing outdoor programs and so forth. You saw the, the young woman crawling off the cliff in the wheelchair. Anyway. So that, those are some of the programs that we work with. Um, and uh, But a lot of young people, uh, what we're all about is inclusion, trying to include young people with disabilities in society. And uh, I know that the Emerging Leader Program is, is still going here at uh, Global Ties. And um, you know, think about how do you engage all young people no matter the background, their ability, their disability, disadvantaged background, um, how do you engage them in, in peaking interest in foreign affairs? Because that's what we're interested in as an organization. And um, you know, think of creative ways to engage those young people with different backgrounds in your organization so they can eventually grow up and be the IBM employees and go overseas and come back and contribute to your CIDs. So. 